saved over here for you. Guys, uh, we get together and sit down. We're going to play a couple of words. It's not easy. Yeah. 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 So I'd like to start it with the word of prayer, if that's all right. Okay. All right, listen up. Hey, we're going to start with the word of prayer, all right? Lord, thank you for tonight. Thank you for the miracles that have walked in this room. Thank you that there's no mistake of why we're here and that we're exactly where we're supposed to be. Thank you that you're sovereign, that you do break chains and you break curses and you can deliver us from all the things we've entangled ourselves with and that, Lord, that we're stronger together and in your name. Uh, I just pray tonight, God, we bring you worship. I pray that the stories would impact us and the message that's getting brought to us uh, by Pete would just impact us again to just crawl closer to the cross. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. we got a couple of worship songs. One's a little hymn. And, uh, the love of God and we're going to do the love of God again. So would you guys please stand with us. It's an older one. All of us that have a few years on us, sing it out please, alright? The love of God. The love of God is greater far than tongue of pain can ever tell the highest star and reaches you the lowest hell the beauty there I'll die with care God gave his son to win his every child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin oh love of God how rich and pure Next 
song we sang last week, we're going to kind of sing it for a while so we can get used to it. This time we have the words up here. <laughs> Reckless love. but it's a fantastic song. Sarah and I, Sarah, not I, Sarah was pregnant with this guy, and who thought it'd be a great idea when you're eight months pregnant but to go to Chicago and walk around in the freezing cold all winter long while you're eight months pregnant. And uh, so there's a pastor I really like. Um, he's uh, in, right, in the, right in Humboldt Park in Chicago, a pretty dangerous area. And uh, I took her to a church there. And so literally across the street there's eight foot high chain link fences around houses and she's kind of like where are you bringing me and I'm like, oh, we're, we're good we're good 
and they sang that song, and it was the first time I'd ever heard it, and it, I love it, and it, it touches me so much because um, that's how much he loves us, right? That's why he did, he did it all for us, and we don't deserve it, and that's why it's so easy for me to give it away, even though it's hard sometimes. I mean, the, sit, the position I'm in at work, I, I, it's some days I feel like I'm bipolar because it's not a, the dealership's not a fun place to go to. But when I have that reminder and I looked around, and it reminds me so much of Chain Breakers because, you know, you've got little ninjas in there, and then you've got, you know, people that are just looking for hope and looking for purpose. And, uh, man, it's just so beautiful. So I had something totally else said to plan to say today, but, man, when I hear that song and I got my little boy here with me, I hope everybody had a good holiday. But, um, hey, you want to sit down, though? You're, just, you're taking away my, my line. Come here, buddy. Come here. <laughs> sit down. The real CEO. <laughs> the, the CEO is taking over the creating energy officer. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Christmas was great and all, and you know, the kids got presents, and after they blew through them all, and you know, then wanted to go get more and wanted to know who's got more presents for them, right? But uh, after everybody was settled down, and Sarah's about to pass out on the couch, I just put on a movie and asked my daughter if she wanted to come sit on my lap and she comes over and then Leo is over there and I was like, you want to sit on my lap too? And for 45 minutes, maybe maybe give or take 45 minutes, we just sat and watched the movie before my kids and I was like, just thanking God because God wants me dead, in jail, or crack face drunk, you know? So I don't remember. I couldn't remember the holiday and that's how I used to be, but no more. So Amen. I Amen. thank God every day. And uh, I'm just so glad to be here. So grateful to see all you guys. We got a packed house. Yeah. Let's get it in. All right. All right.
take one, start to read it, have it write in it, underline verses that you love. This, I noticed, was back there on the table, too. This is an incredible, this is a New Testament. This is a life application Bible, which, which is scripture, and then it has um, encouraging notes at the bottom that explain verses and asks you a question. It, it applies the scripture to your life by asking you a question. It is one of the best um, study Bibles that you can have. So there's only one of these, and there's a bunch of these. And if you have a Bible on your shelf at home, get it out. Make it a 2023 goal to read it every day because it is God's love letter to us. Ronnie, are you in the house? I don't see him. Hey, hey, welcome back. Oh, there you are. Come on, bro. Come on. <laughs> yeah, Ronnie. How you all doing? Yeah, Ronnie. Well, praise the Lord. So, uh, always a pleasure to be here. So thankful that uh, I was able to make it through another Christmas. Amen. You know, I actually remembered everything that happened during Christmas. Right. You know, I, I, I just want to just encourage you guys. I hope that was the same situation. I do hold, I do hold an apology. I had an individual from the group that, that contacted me. Uh, and just so happened, I was kind of groggy. I, uh, you know, I was kind of sleepy. You know what I mean? And, and, and I probably wasn't on my best behavior. But I wanted to let, you, let the guy know that I, I'm sorry about that. You know, I plan on contacting you. So don't even worry about it. You know, God is great. God is great. Uh, I'm just so thankful that you know I had a, I had a really great Christmas. You know, uh, you know, God has been so good to me and so good to. I'm sure many of you guys. I just see. So many people have made it out here tonight. You guys are always out here to encourage other people. You know, it's not so much about what you what you end up getting, what you end up getting. It's really so much about what you guys are giving. You know, and so I'm just encouraged just to be a part of that. I'm encouraged to just come out just to share anything that God has given me during the course of the week. And this is one thing that I just want to share. Um, there's, that often, there's often several different things we get to share, but this one particular book uh, out of the many books that I ended up getting. This one here is a deeper desire for God to strengthen our spirit. And it talks a little bit about a deeper desire for Christ. And it's uh, quoted from the uh, scripture, uh, Psalms 42, 1, which talks about as the deer pants for a stream of water, how our soul truly pants for God. Yes. You know, and like, you know, as, as we get longer and longer in this journey, we realize that really nothing can really satisfy us like God can. You know, nothing can really satisfy us like the word of God and the things of God. You know what I mean? The people of God. You know what I mean? Uh, and it talks about how man now is in a new relationship, each, and, and women. We're also we're in new relationships now. You know, once we are heirs to wrath, but now we're children of God. We're we're bond slaves. We're now free men. We rejoice in Jesus Christ and, and we feast on his fullness. He was a citizen of earth once, but he is now a citizen of heaven. We once was found beneath the clouds, but now we're found beyond the stars. We have new relationships. Christ is our brother, God is our father, and the angels are our, our friends. And the despised people of God are our best friends and our nearest kin folks. Uh, and hence, man has a new aspiration. We, we, we look to different things. We desire different things. We now pant to glorify God. What did, what did we care about the glory of God before? We now pant to see God. We now uh, realize that we have a, a future which has been paid for us, and it costs Christ his life. Uh, so, and, and now we, we're looking to escape from the presence of the evil ones. That's what we're looking to escape from. So now we hunger and we thirst after a living God. And, uh, if, his, if, we're, if our souls had wings, we could break the fetters of, his, of our mortality. We would mount up at once and dwell where Jesus Christ dwells. So, you know, I just wanted to encourage you guys with that, with that bit of scripture, you know, and, and just know that we, we're all looking forward to things that are greater than ourselves, you know, and that's, and that's, our, that has to be our journey. That has to be our call. So I just wanted to encourage you guys with that. I think I believe I'm turning over to Gordy now with prayer. No. So you, oh, no, oh, not a problem. Uh, but I'm just thankful for everything. God bless you all. All right, just a couple quick announcements. Then we'll get Gordy up here in a couple minutes. Uh, Brady's okay, you're sitting here. Okay. Uh, we're going to be doing our icebreaker in a few minutes, so I want you to think about this. And uh, so just be thinking about this. Here, here's what it is. Sorry, I flipped away for a second. Um,
Okay, the icebreaker in a few minutes is going to be, what's one thing Jesus did that you would like to do or are doing? Okay, what's one thing Jesus did that you would like to do or are doing? Okay, so uh, just a few announcements. Uh, we're in desperate need of a car for somebody, so uh, if you guys see like your neighbor's got like a car that hasn't moved in a couple months, like go steal it or knock on the door or something. Because <laughs> we got a guy that really needs a car so he can get back and forth to work. So please spread the word out there. Um, we know there's something out there. So that would be appreciated. Um, also, um, we got guys looking for jobs. So come see me if wherever you're working at is hiring and I can you know spread the word on. And then uh, always looking for mentors to come alongside. We want every guy here to have a mentor and gal. So if uh, you're in need of that, uh, come come let me know. Um, again, we got all our Bibles and stuff like Cynthia said on the back table. Next week, we got an amazing guy. He was raised Hindu and he was an idol worshiper, okay? He spoke here a couple years ago. Most people probably don't remember him. His name is Shatru. And Shatru is gonna be here next week and he is amazing. And uh, he's got a wonderful story and the way he delivers it, you're gonna be on the edge of your seat. So if you know anybody that Maybe as Hindu, Muslim, you know, whatever. Invite him in. Let's see what God does. Yeah. And uh, just, uh, yeah, super, super encouraging guy. And uh, can't wait for you guys to get to meet him again. And then uh, I just got some kind of sad news here the last couple of weeks. Craig, share, uh, share real quick about uh, one of the guys that was here two weeks ago, right? You want to come on up here just for a second? Craig. Craig. How you doing? This guy, uh, his name is Joe Doolin. A uh, couple of you guys probably know him. He was here two weeks ago. He had left the uh, team challenge. And he was struggling with this God thing in any way he left. And I seen him when me and Craig came here like two weeks ago. He was sitting in that back row by himself. And I gave him a hug and I said, How are you doing? But he didn't look at that. He was going back to work. I said he was doing great. But anyway, when I came back from my pass on Monday morning, You know, that's why we do what we do. TJ's here this this, uh, this evening. TJ, raise your hands so everybody see who you are. TJ lost his brother to suicide. What's it been, four to five weeks now? Uh, November 11th. November 11th. And uh, guys, TJ, sorry about your loss, man. I, I just, I can't imagine. We're going to be covering that in, in the months to come, um, suicide and how it's affected families and have people come in and share how they can find you know, victory after. And, uh, but that's why we do what we do, right? Because, I mean, so many people get out of these wonderful ministries like Teen Challenge and the enemy's sitting right outside the door. Yeah. You know, uh, Jeremy tells a story of, you know, he had four guys graduate with him and three of them were dead after one year. Is that right, Jeremy? Right. And, you know, that's not the first thing they're thinking when they get out of there, but the enemy is alive. And that's why we do what we do here. To, to be a bridge when people come out of these programs or work here or whatever situation you're in and maybe we can you know help save a few and uh so again my heart goes out to your family tj and uh craig your friend that was here a couple weeks ago joe and it, it's it's uh it's real it's real stuff so that's why we do what we do and you guys are loved and cared for and uh, yeah never give up never give up uh, I think the next thing is uh, Steve's going to come and uh, chat about his little mission uh, trip he's going to be taking. So come on up, brother. Give us a, give us a little word. <laughs> I just think I got to change it up a little bit after. Yeah. You know, talking about all these people that are old here. Uh, love you know that I'm in ministry that involves men and discipling men and. This trip that I'm going on, this trip that I'm going on, is you know it's basically what God tells us to do. You can just put the microphone down. That's not for the share, share yeah. the gospel, 
and make disciples of men of all nations. Don said, you know, people need disciples and stuff. Even though I'm traveling, I'm not going to be still not discipling. I can do that by phone. And I learned from a pastor here a couple of weeks ago, we can co-disciple. Guys, we co-disciple right here. Amen. So it doesn't just have to be a one-on-one -on -one thing. But anyhow, um, the trip that uh, I'm going, I, I left last winter and went on the uh, west, western side of the United States. And, uh, you, a lot of you know, guys know about fire-based ministry. I got involved with them a few years ago and, and uh, wanted to touch base with some of them. And I met a pastor in California, and I was listening to him last night. And he mentioned that God created us to love us. And I thought, wow, that just struck me. And in my still time this morning, I um, I thought, I was thinking about that. And then I read a devotion. And in the devotion this morning, from Psalms 143, verse 8, it says, Tell me in the morning about your love, because I trust you. Show me what I should do, because my prayers are And I've been asking them, you know, show me what you want me to do. And I thought about Cynthia last week and then she brought it up again today that the Bible is God's love story. Every, every time I think about what I'm supposed to do as a witness for Christ, the word love comes up all the time. Yeah. All the time. You know? And um, so, okay, so I'm going to these verses. You've heard them a million times, but um, in Acts 8 and 1, you know, you know where I'm going to go. Um, Acts 1, 8. Acts 1, 8, yep. Yeah. But when the Holy Spirit comes to you, you will receive power. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to Jay Break. Amen. And, um, and then he talked about sharing the gospel and making disciples of men of all nations. And um, Mark 16, 15. Go everywhere in the world and tell the good news. Mm -hmm. Amen. Go everywhere in the world and tell everybody how much the Father loves them. Mm, that's right. Amen. That's what I'm going to do. Amen. On this trip, you know. Player uh, base, um, when I got hooked up with them, and there's a lot of, you know, Sean, I think of Pete, you know, and, 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 and all the different people that are out there sharing the gospel. And, um, uh, they talk about mobilizing the church. I go, what do you mean by mobilizing the church? Sharing the gospel, make disciples of men of all nations. I was a part of Old Grove and always will be for the day I die. And you, there's not too many sermons that don't go by where you don't hear Pastor Brad talk about sharing the gospel and making disciples of the gospel. I hear it from Pete. I hear it all the time. And I think that's what God's really pouring out in his heart. So, um, you know, I'm just excited to do that. It's not always easy, and um, but um, you know, it's, I just thank you for the prayers and everything else. And um, hopefully, um, when I get back, you know, I'll maybe get to share one divine intervention because there was many yeah. last night. Amen. There'll be lots of them. Yeah. And the only the only one I'll, that I shared was that pastor that I met. It was Pastor Chris Leeper. I think I sent down some stuff from the Leeper family. Nine kids. And they're, they were prophesied over to share the gospel in California. That's all they do. Amen. 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 Oh, he's going to, yeah, go ahead. We're going to pray for you. Right before we pray for him, we just, I just want to, first of all, thank Cynthia for talking about the Bible because this is the Word of God. Amen. This is living, it's active. And sometimes we kind of wonder what's God's will. The way you find out God's will is through his word. <laughs> and so whatever concerns you have, whatever question you have, it's in this Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, every answer that you ever will have is in this book. Amen. But also, we are called, ladies and gentlemen, to glorify Jesus Christ, but also to point other people to Jesus Christ. Yes, That's our job here on earth. Hebrews 9, 27 says this. It is appointed to man once to die, but after this the judgment. Everyone in this room has a point with death. It's a coming. We don't like to always think about it or talk about it, but we all 
have a date with death. And so we can put it off and say, ah, I'll probably live another 20, 30 years. We have no guarantee we'll be here tomorrow. Something to keep in mind, if the Holy Spirit points something out from Danny's testimonies, from Pete speaking, if you're here today, you never accept Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, Preacher. you're not following him, today is the day of salvation. Yeah, right. Get that settled before you leave, you leave here. Because that's what Jesus died for, is to birth you into the family of God. He's still be building his kingdom, and he wants you in it. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. We enter your gates with thanksgiving. We enter your courts with praise. We thank you for Steve. We thank you for the trip that this group is about to take. We pray that you go before them, prepare our hearts, give them divine encounters, but also, Lord, that the Holy Spirit have liberty to work in those folks who don't know you. And so give these folks some fruit, may the ground be really good, and that we see these folks birth into the family of God. We pray for Danny tonight, we pray for Pete tonight, and we pray for the rest of this service that everything that's said and done will bring glory to you. May the Holy Spirit touch that one person here who may have religion but don't have a relationship with you. May they humble themselves, and today they follow you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Thank you for chain breakers. Thank you that Jesus is the one who breaks the chain mm. of sin. <laughs> Everyone in this room, Lord, as you laid on that cross and shed your royal red blood, it was for them. It was for us. And we thank you for doing that. As we head to 2023, help us to never be ashamed of the gospel and help us to continue, Lord, to share the good news with those folks that you bring across our path. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul, I saw you out here somewhere. Sorry, I want to remember you and your loss of your hubby. Was that five weeks ago now? September 13th. September 13th, so... Again, our sympathy goes out to you, losing your husband, as you shared a couple weeks ago, so bravely. And uh, just want to yeah, welcome you. You're part of the family, part of the community here. So we will never forget that. So. All right, we just got a couple minutes for an icebreaker. We want to hear from you guys, okay? See these six chairs? This is the hot seat, okay? Let's fill them up. Even if you don't have something to say, come up here and trust God will give you something to say. How's that? Amen. We'll see who's got faith out there. All right, so again, the, the icebreaker is what's one thing Jesus did? I mean, Jesus was non traditional, right? What's one thing he did that you want to do, or maybe you're doing it now, you're trying to do it, okay? We'd love to hear from you. So just uh, come on. Craig's up here. Let's line up yeah. this front row. <laughs> First thing that I thought of when John said that was <clears throat> Jesus stood at the tomb of Lazarus and said, Lazarus, come out of there. I'd like to be able to do that. <laughs> but I don't think that's got purpose for me. But here's what I really want to do that Jesus did. He saw the multitudes and he was moved with compassion because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Mm. Yeah. I want that. Wow. Amen. Amen. The things that Jesus did, what he always did, was always about pleasing his father. And when I first got born again, that's what stuck in my mind. When I'm tempted to do something, or I want to go astray, I'm always thinking about pleasing God. And so I want to challenge you guys to, Jesus always wanted to please his father. And so that is our goal, to please God. Because we got to stand before Christ when we give account of our life. And so that's one thing that I remember. Jesus always pleased his father. All right. Thanks, Cody. Yeah, thanks, Cody. Johnny, Johnny. Johnny, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that, that Jesus did, he was against all odds at all times. He had uh, so many different people after him, you know, trying to arrest him, trying to persecute him. And he ended up flipping a lot of the people into believers, you know. All right. One of the things that we read a lot about is Jesus rose early in the morning before people started looking for him and went to a desolate place to pray. 
And I'm an early riser, but I have to confess most of the time what I'm doing isn't praying right away in the morning. And so that's something Jesus did that I really want to start doing more in 2023 is taking time in the morning to pray. Amen. All right. So I never thought I'd ever stand up here and talk to you. And now it's like every other week. Yes. <laughs> so anyways, that's kind of a big move for me. But also I... Uh, have long taught little ones about Jesus yes. and really deep concepts. It's funny how much they take in if you really just keep feeding it to them. But um, teens and adults have always been kind of on the fringe. They've shown up at the edges of the room or something once in a while. But I told you a couple weeks ago I spoke with a Buddhist <coughs> about Jesus. And now yesterday I talked with a Jewish woman about Jesus. Nice. Well, I talked with her more about God, but the whole concept. So she was asking me some things about my life and stuff because we work together now. And, and I said, well, you know, I'm a Christian, right? She goes, yes. So then I finished answering her, and she said, Cheryl, you've given me a lot to think about. Amen. I'm going to go home and talk to my husband about this. <laughs> so that was good. <laughs>
for some prescriptions. And you tell me who to go see. And when I saw her, and I told her that these are things that God can't do, and she started to cry right away. And this girl said to me, she says, I'm a Christian. <laughs> well, why are you here? <laughs> right away, she says, I'll pray for her. But these are things that you just never know what's going to happen, whoever you talk to. I always remember every single day, every person I meet, I don't know them at all. They all need, probably 99% of them don't know anything about Jesus Christ. We cannot pass them up. Amen. Love old people. <laughs> Jake Bummer. Um, hey, uh, my wife, who's going to share a testimony. Um, what I'd like to share is that, you know, it's interesting having a really close view of somebody's testimony, especially their life story. And, you, you know, the funny thing is the, 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 the question was if you could be like Jesus, what you'd do? I, there was a time in my life when I met my wife, and she wasn't my wife. And I learned about all the different things that she had to survive in her life. And I wish I could have been Jesus. Mm -hmm. And it broke me that I couldn't be, because I thought I could. With every effort, I tried. And that was something that uh, was heart-wrenching, because I wanted to give her something better than I had, and I had a good life. Um, it's totally I thought. Long story short is, it's also interesting who God can use to bring you to himself. And in the midst of, as you'll hear in her story tonight, uh, just a messy place, I can give credit that she's the one that led the way out of the darkness into the light. And uh, so I wouldn't be here part of Chain Breakers. I, I, I mean, beyond just that she's the one that invited me to come here. <laughs> it took her invitation to get me here, and that's the reality of it. Um, and so uh, the other thing I want to share about her is that she's courageous. You can't judge a book by, your co by its cover. My wife, no offense, guys, is a beautiful, beautiful woman. But there's so much more behind. I can tell you this. She also loves to ask intriguing questions. I'm not this guy. But, but she actually authentically cares. So what I do want to share is that to, in order for her to tell her old testimony, she would have several weeks, right? But she doesn't have that. And so if you do hear some things that you'd like to relate to her with, I invite you to find her and ask her. And you get a chance to, she can tell you more of a story. The other thing I'll tell you about is she's not ashamed of the gospel. She will share it with anyone in any condition. I can tell you that. Amen. Uh, without further ado, I will introduce my beautiful wife. I better have Danny. <laughs> strangers in the house could get to me. 
Um, she would let me out once in a while to use the bathroom. She would bring me food. Um, but other than that, it was, you know, just here's some toys and, you know, you do you. Um, and then when I was five, she had my little brother. Uh, so I'm five years older than him. And I remember uh, that at the age of five, she lost parental rights, her parental rights of me. And so, and then I just lived in the foster care system. I lived in the foster care system, home after home. Um, I was, it was a lot of instability. It was a lot of uncertainty. It was a lot of, uh, you know, no, no permanent place for a child. You know, let's just say I ended up like, like a drifter. You know, like that's kind of what my life turned into. I was a, a drifter. I didn't belong anywhere. I didn't have a home per se. And uh, that's just kind of what I knew to just float around. Um, let's see here. So there was a time though where I had a good about good five years in in a foster home where I called them mom and dad because they were the longest term parents I ever had and I knew them from when I was a very young girl. I was their foster child first. So um, I grew up with them for, for, like I said, five stable years or so, but I had a lot of emotional problems. I had a lot of uh, rage. I had a lot of uh, just disorganization as far as the way I functioned, the way that I interacted with people. Um, I, I wasn't, I wasn't right. You know, I was an angry, angry child. And, uh, so they did the best with me that they could, but that it didn't last. So, uh, I moved from foster home to foster home. And at the age of 18, like this whole time I'm in foster care, I'm thinking like, okay, once I turn 18, nobody can tell me what to do anymore. Nobody owns my life anymore. I'm gonna get out here and the world is mine, you know, uh, Scarface style, you know, straight up like I'm gonna take over. Um, I don't know. And I didn't know what I wanted to be where I grew up. I just knew I wanted to be free from what people, you know, from what people, where people could tell me to be, where people could tell me to live, all, like, all this stuff, you know, like just to be an adult. Um, but when I turned 18, I was not ready for it. So uh, I did a lot, I did some drugs when I was growing up, I, I did some, I didn't um, go hard, so to speak, um, until I found alcohol, that was, that's what did it for me. But, um, I'm just gonna slow down here. I should have had notes, but this is, all right. this is all, this is, this is all good. I'm, You're I'm doing okay. okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Um, I, uh, I smoked a lot of weed and dabbled here and there, but the one thing I did learn was that once I got my first job, my first paycheck paying job when I was 15, because that was the allowance cut off, once you're 15, old enough to work, you don't get no more allowance, you work for that, you know? Once I got my first check for McDonald's, it was like $283, and I had worked like 46 hours a week or something like that, right? For like $7.25 an hour, right? When I got that first paycheck, I was like, this is amazing! You know, this is, I can do this, you know? So I, I learned how to work hard to get, you know, the check. And um, so anyway, fast forward a little bit till I turn 18, you know, till I turn 18, two weeks after my 18th birthday, I come home and the rules were simple. You come home at 10 o'clock, you don't come home high, you don't come home drunk, you know, simple rules, that's it, you know what I mean? Well, anyway, I come home two weeks after I turn 18, there is the, the locks are changed on the door and there's two big black garbage bags sitting outside the door. And my mom and dad just straight up kicked me out and I lived like way out in the suburbs where like you need a car to get around, you know what I mean? And that was just, that, I didn't have a license, I didn't have anything. So um, I came down to Minneapolis because this is like where public transit is, there's more job opportunities here. And uh, I, I figured the cities would be a better place than the suburbs to me. And I'm glad I got out because everyone that I know that is still in that, my hometown, Anoka, um, they're pretty far gone on meth and heroin. Um, so that's unfortunate. Um, but anyway, because my mom was a crackhead, I didn't get into meth and heroin because it, they were, I, it, it was too close to resemble to like what my mom was like for me. And so I just, I didn't touch that stuff. 
Um, so I came to the city, like I said, when I was 18, and I moved into a transitional, transitional, so, or transitional house for runaway teens at the age of 18 called The Bridge. It's in Minneapolis. And um, I, like I said, I didn't know nothing about nothing. I wasn't street smart. I wasn't, you know, I, I, I had no knowledge about anything. So um, I met a guy who was four years older than me. He, uh, he told me he had a job. He told me he was in college. He told me that he uh, was taking care of his mom. This, this, and that, and the other. And so I believed that. You know, I was, I was young. I was impressionable. I believed that. And anyway, he ended up getting me pregnant, um, still 18, and I had, like I said, no idea about nothing, right? And I, I realized that this, that this guy had like manipulated me and lied to me. And so I had my, my daughter when I was uh, just turned 19, and I was like, I can't do this. Like nobody told me what um, postpartum depression was. Nobody told me, uh, you know, what it's like to be a mother at such a young age. No one prepared me for it, no one helped me. So I felt all alone and I was like, I can't do this. I'm going back to college, here's the baby. I'll come back when I'm done and I graduate, peace. And I just left, and I just left. And um, so I went to college though, I did. Um, I stayed pretty close to where my daughter uh, lived and was being raised at the time. Um, but I just didn't see her. I mean, I had such a disconnect from her that I thought like, I'm just, a, I, like, I'm, I'm damned. Like, like, what, you know, what mother doesn't want to even hold her child, right? I thought it was me, like, I, there was something mentally, physically wrong with me, and it was. It's postpartum depression. I just didn't know it. So, um, anyway, I, I was in school, and I wanted to work for the FBI. That's what I was going to school for. I was going to school, <laughs> studying criminology. I wanted to be a badass FBI agent, you know, that could like low key do karate and whips and tricks and like, you know, shoot an Uzi and like just all this stuff. You know, I love cop shows. Um, so my my second year in college, uh, one night I was walk I was gonna go to a party. So it was an early night in Dinky Town, if you guys know where that is in Minneapolis. Uh, it was an early night in Dinky Town. I was just coming home from Subway and uh, I I was also selling a little bit of weed at this time, so uh, enough so that they gave me the nickname the Queen, okay? So anyway, I was coming home, I just got done hustling a little bit, and these two men are walking towards me, and I just get this feeling inside of me, I know now that it was the Lord, uh, but it just, I had this feeling inside of me that just said like, don't walk on the sidewalk, right? So these guys are coming towards me, walking on the sidewalk, I step outside the sidewalk, and I don't know why I did this because I typically just keep my phone like in my purse, but it, I put it in my hoodie pocket for some reason, for some reason. And these guys were walking towards me and they had asked me, do you know what time it is? And uh, I didn't know what time it was. I just checked my phone before I put it in my hoodie pocket. And then uh, before I could even answer them, like I had a gun at my head and uh, I was assaulted and robbed and what's even, worse is that the party I was going to was like from here to that doorway and if someone would have looked out the window at that time when it was happening because the window was open no shades were the blinds were open they would have seen what was being done to me so it was like help was so close but I had never felt so far so alone like in that moment so anyway uh made a police report and all that and the next day I went to go to class and it was like, I got to the city bus stop because that's what I took to go to class. And <clears throat> fear like I never felt before came over me. I felt like I was gonna die. I, I, my heart was racing, my mind was racing. I felt like I was gonna pass out and just die. Like my heart was gonna explode. And so I ran back to my dorm room and I stayed there for like two weeks straight. I knew because of the, the, the schooling I was taking, what was happening to me psychologically, mentally, emotionally. I was experiencing trauma. I was experiencing, um, I was experiencing trauma and I was having panic attacks, but I could not bring myself to ask for help. Now all this to say, I knew God. I knew, I knew I've, I've always believed that God existed. I, I just thought he was like this big guy up in the sky that like was uninterested in anything that was going on. So I just thought he was like up there watching me, right? Um, and so I didn't, I didn't bother to ask for help. I didn't bother to, 
do anything about it until two weeks after I was in my room. I said, okay, you know what? I'm tired of living this way. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of this house. I'm gonna go to a party. I'm gonna do something. So I went to the liquor store. I somehow managed to walk there, shaking and trembling. And I went back to my dorm room with a bottle and I had a free game drink. And it was like, all of a sudden, ting, the lights went on and Danny's back. Like I had my personality back. I had my swag back. I had me back. You know what I mean? And I was like, okay. So everywhere I went, there was like either a little something like this for a little vodka or it was, it was something, but I never went anywhere without any booze because that was for me, like what fixed me, what made me okay to move around. Um, and so this is where the story kind of gets started. <coughs> How many minutes do I got? 10. I got 10? Oh yeah, you're good. Okay. 10, here we go. <coughs> so, uh, this is where it speeds up a little bit. One night, uh, a girl from my dorm, she comes home, she's got wads full of money on her, and I'm like, where did you get that? She goes, looks at me, and just says one thing, that is not for you. And I said, okay, so I let her up. A couple weeks later, we're hanging out, same thing, she had wads full of money. And basically, she was a lady of the night, and she got me into that life. And somehow, I still thought, this is how blinding and gripping addiction is, is that I thought, these things I'm doing, I'm still in control. Like, I, like I got this. Like, it's, I, you know what I mean? Like, I got this. I'm gonna come up and then I'm gonna put this life behind me. But every sip I took got me more and more hooked. I did not know about physical addiction. I did not know uh, what withdrawals were. I didn't even know anything about that. So that went on for four, five, six years. And then I met Let's see, I met Jake. Like five years after my robbery, I met, I met Jake. And I met my husband, and he, if, if anything, he didn't, he didn't know Jesus at all. I mean, he, he did, but he didn't claim him. He didn't, he didn't say, you know, like I'm a Christian, none of that. But the way that he relentlessly pursued me and just, well, no matter what condition I was in, you guys, he was always there. He would always come find me. He would always try to, like, he would just walk alongside me in life. And it didn't matter. He didn't judge me. He didn't, he didn't anything, you know. He just was there for me. And um, so anyway, uh, when I met Jake, I was I was pretty low. Has anyone in here heard of the Drake Hotel? Yeah. Okay. That's where I was living, okay? Because, you know, when you can't verify your income, your options are limited. So I was living at the Drake, you know, 167 a week. That's pretty good. Not more. <laughs> Not more. I know it's burned down. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Yeah. Um, yep. So that, I met my husband um, at, a, at, a, at a club. And um, it's kind of like when we met, more of our life started to unravel, I should say. Because whatever he had going on, slowly started coming on, like unraveled. And then what I had going on, hella unraveled. And we ended up like, like straight up being homeless, burning every single bridge we had. Um, you know, uh, screwing as many people over as possible just to just to survive is what we did, and we were we were good at it until we had nowhere. So anyway, um, Jake and I were like literally staying at Ten Ten Curry for some good time, like off and on for like a year. And I remember there was one time Jake couldn't get in because they had a line, and men could only be allowed in the building at like a certain time. And it was like negative thir like three degrees outside. I could be let in for the night and have a bed, but I said, no, I'm gonna stand out here with my man because you know what, like we've, we've endured life together and done worse things than stand outside. So I'll be here. Anyway, um, now this is where God intervenes for me. It's like I, Amen. we were sleeping on Lake Street and Chicago Greenway for somewhere to sleep for the night and uh, in the morning when I woke up, I was like, before I could even like grab this bottle, before I could even like attend my to attend to my withdrawal, I heard the voice of the Lord say, "That's enough," mm. and it was like so firm yet gentle uh, that it got to me. Like I looked at Jake and I said, "Like I can't do this anymore. I can't. Like, like I can't do this anymore." And he brought me to detox and. Um, I think they said I blew, I walked in and I blew a point, what? Four, five, seven. Point four, five, seven. And I, I was used to that. You know, I, I was, I was, if I wasn't at least that, I was shaking and everything else, so it wasn't good. 
So anyway, then I um, made the journey to Minnesota Don't Teen Challenge. I stayed there for 16 months. It's a year program. <laughs> <laughs> Just took me a little bit longer to surrender. It's all right. you know? um, but the Lord got to me. The Lord got to me. And I was like, Lord, I don't know who you are, even if you are just some big man up in the sky that is uninterested in me. I'm sorry for everything I've done. If you just please just take my life from like me and, and help me just to even overcome this treatment thing and get me like a sober bedroom at a sober living place, like I'll be good, like I'll I'll be so grateful. Like I can't like I just don't want to live this life anymore. I do yeah. not want to live this life anymore. And if you live long enough, you realize that this the world is not a playground, it's a battlefield. That's it's right. a straight up battlefield. So I gave my life to Jesus in 2018. Amen. Um, officially, yeah. yeah. Uh, I love the Lord. I, I love Jesus and everything that he has done for me, everything that he's done for you guys that I get to hear about sometimes. You guys stand up here and say, uh, testify what he's done for you. Now, where I'm at today is I'm a licensed realtor in the state of Minnesota. All right. Um, that is, uh, that is, uh, maybe a story for another time, but let's just say that I'm struggling a little bit because I come from the streets, right? So when I, but I know where my identity is and I know that right. I'm a kingdom and a citizen of heaven and that right. this is not my home. I'm here on assignment right now and I work for the king. Amen. But when I am in front of these regular, what it seems like regular Joe Schmoes who got their, their stuff together that can buy a house and look at different types of property and, and decide what their mortgage payments is going to be. I don't feel worthy. I feel like, what am I doing here? To be honest with you, like, I'm scared. You know, like, these guys are, are, are got, they know how to do life. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just learned. <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> so anyway, um, just pray for me going forward that, you know, uh, but you know what, to be honest with you, when I get in front of these buyers and sellers, I kill it. I do. The, 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 the fear I had goes out the window, all this stuff, and I, I, I'm myself. I'm this person right here. But uh, it's not it's not to say that I, you know, shut up. <laughs> I love you. Uh, first of all, I just want to shout out Ashley Crow in the back. This morning, she sent me a text of encouragement, and I straight up snapped at her and text. I was like, I do not need an unsolicited lecture. And so, because she was just trying to encourage me to not be nervous tonight and to just tell me, and I was like, I don't need you to tell me, you know. So anyway, two minutes. What can I tell you in two minutes? Um, God has restored. God has restored what the locusts have eaten. That's right. That's right. Uh, his promises are true. Um, hold tight to what he has told you because it is true. Everything he has started, he will complete. Um, and these things Amen. are all in his word. These things Amen. are all in his word, and I'm just living proof of it. Amen. I would not be here today if it was not for Kim and Tom Bellner as well. They took me in when they didn't know me from is it Adam, is that the same? Yeah. Right? Um, and they loved me, they trusted me, and they have seen me grow, and I'm just glad that they have seen me grow, and that I'm not, I'm not stuck in that, you know, in my mess. So, um, every day is a fight. Like I said, it's a battlefield now. Right. Right now. And together we got this. We can Amen. do this. Amen. And if anyone wants any other, um, you know, bits of my story, I'm happy to share. But thank, thank you. you so much. For All right. Me. <laughs> he used to be just a killer rapper. Oh, right on. Yes. He loves it. Prove it. Uh, no, but man. <laughs> so I, I've known Peter since, I don't know, 10th, 11th grade. Um, just kind of running around the, the hallways at school. Usually, me trying to calm him down, keep 
in this class. Um, but man, like our relationship just started out at such a different point than it is now. Uh, it just from us being a bunch of dumb, knucklehead, you know, teenage boys um, into leading um, a, there's a youth ministry called Young Life. Um, we like Young Life together for years. And man, it's been so cool. He's one of my friends that I've seen grow probably more than anybody um, just from what he came from and just really just taking on the challenge that God has given him um, to be an awesome pastor, to be a really great dad and husband. Um, so yeah, just give up for peace. Yeah. 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 No, it's so good to be here tonight, and the last couple weeks have been fun, man, uh, just as we've dug into God's Word. Uh, but man, we're coming up on that time of year right now, we're, we're, we're approaching a new year, right? Uh, we're coming up to the end of this year, and everyone's kind of looking ahead, and all across the world right now, people are making New Year's resolutions, right? We've heard the saying, New Year, New Me. <laughs> people are like fixated on, on what can I change in my life? What can I adjust? What can I tweak to make my life better? Right? I'm, I'm going to start working out more. I'm going to eat less. I'm going to go better. I'm going to wake up or whatever it is, right? We're listing off these things that we can do to make our life better. We're listing off the, these things that we can control, that we can adjust, that we can tweak and just change. And maybe, man, my life will be just a little bit better than it was the year before. But, man, I, I, when I look at this happening, right, there's something about this time of year that just causes people to look within themselves and take a deeper analysis of their, their lives and then long for something different in this new year as if the change of a calendar year is going to change their entire life, right? Uh. But, see, when you look at this, when you analyze New Year's resolutions, right, just a, this is just a little teeny tiny example of what I think is a core desire in each and every one of our hearts. See, when you look at this, this tendency to, to introspectively look at our life and say, man, what can I change to make my life better? See, I think there's a root desire that's at the bottom of that, that's in every single one of our hearts. See, every single one of us has is either longing right now or has longed for a fresh start, right. for a better life. Right? It's this, this, this deep, deep longing in every single person's heart. You might be sitting in this room like, I've never made a New Year's resolution in my life. It doesn't matter. You still have a deep longing for a new start and a better life. Deeper meaning, deeper purpose. Each and every one of us has that same commonality in our lives. We long for a fresh start, a deeper meaning, and a deeper, a deeper life. See, and I believe that God has placed that desire in each and every one of our hearts. Romans 8, Paul talks about it. He says, the entire creation, all of creation is groaning. It's longing in anticipation for God to reveal his sons and daughters. What Paul is saying is every single person, all of creation, that's you and that's me, is longing for God to return and make all things new. Right. That's just a deep desire that each and every one of us have, even if we don't know it. We are longing for God to return and make all things new. Amen. See, I, I just want to propose this to you tonight. Your life can't change by just making simple adjustments, simple tweaks. See, you can't just wake up and say, well, I'm just going to do this tomorrow and, and everything will be better for the rest of my life. See, <laughs> real, tangible satisfaction, joy, peace, happiness, goodness, gladness, everything that is good and awesome and amazing that can lead to a sustained, meaningful life can only come from one place. That's right. It can only come from one person. Jesus. That's right. <laughs> And this is the good news, right? God has this same desire for us. See, he longs to make us new. That's the whole reason Jesus came. Right. Was to lead us. Jesus himself said in John 10, 10, 10, he says this. He says, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come so that you might have an abundant life. Jesus came to bring us into a deep and meaningful life. That is God's desire for each and every one of us. And if you're sitting in this room doubting tonight, my prayer is that God convinces you otherwise. Right, so Revelation 21. Uh, Jesus had a, a, had, a, had a, a circle of friends, right? His disciples, and within that that 12 people that he rolled around, there was an even deeper circle. Was his best friends, and John was one of those, right? John was his best friend. They called the apostle. 
at the Last Supper, he laid his head on Jesus' shoulder. Okay, so Jesus died, he rises, he ascends to heaven, and, and the apostles keep going on with the ministry that Jesus had given them. Go and tell people about the kingdom of God. Go and tell them about the light that has come to give life to all of creation. And, and so John was going, and all of a sudden John has this revelation. That's why the book's called Revelation, right? He has this revelation, he has this vision of heaven. Oftentimes this book is twisted and people try and make it sound really like scary and weird. It's none of that, right? Jesus, John has this vision of the kingdom of heaven, right? In Revelation 21, John is seeing how God is going to bring all of creation into newness, how he's going to restore it. And so we pick up in, in, in Revelation 21, John is having a vision of heaven. Verse 3. John says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eye and there will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying and no more pain. Amen. All of these things will be gone forever. Amen. And then John says this, verse five. And the one sitting on the throne, Jesus said this. Look, I am making everything new. new. Yeah. And then he said to me, John, write this down for what I am telling you is trustworthy and true. See, this is a forward vision, right? Like John is seeing into what's going to take place. And Jesus looks at him in the middle of the vision and says, John, I am making all things new. That's present tense. That means that what John is trying to tell us is right now, the business that God is in, is in restoring and redeeming and making all things new. And guess what? God is looking out for all of creation. And his starting point, his reference, like where he begins this work of redeeming all of creation is with you and me. Amen. He says, John, I am making all things new. See, so often we look at our lives and we're like, well, man, maybe if I could just change this or maybe not respond this way or do this or whatever. We start to figure out what we can do to change our lives. And John's telling us, no, no, that's not, it's not going to happen because of you. It's not going to be happening because what you're doing in your day-to-day -day life. It can only happen from Jesus because he is making all things new. And he keeps going. In verse 6, he says, and Jesus also said this, it is finished. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To all who are thirsty, I will freely give from the springs of water of life, the water of life. So get this, right? Jesus is saying, look, I am the God of all creation. There's no other before me. I am the God of all of creation. And to those who are thirsty, I will give the water of life. Man, envision this, right? You're, you're trapped in the middle of a desert. It's been days since you've ate food, drank water. The sun's beating down on you. You are miserable. You're hopeless. You're burdened. You're desperate. You feel like you're at the brink of despair. And all of a sudden, you come across this stream trickling across this desert and you fall to your knees you just take one sip and you're like man I have been restored I have been made new I have received life see what Jesus is saying in Revelation 21 is he's saying if you want the water of life I am where you find it if you want a new life if you want satisfaction if you want peace it doesn't start out here it starts with me fix your eyes on the king yes See, Jesus is telling each and every one of us tonight, you can make as many New Year's resolutions as you want. I've tried. I, I, my wife challenged me that I couldn't work out every single day of the year. I worked out for 168 days. I missed it on 160 days. I never got back on the work. It doesn't work. And Jesus is saying, look, you can try all the ways that you want to fix your life, but you won't be able to do it. But if you're longing for a new life, if you're longing for hope, if you're feeling broken, if you're feeling miserable, if you're feeling bitter, if you're feeling sad, look to Jesus. That's right. He says, to all who are thirsty, yes. I will give you the water of life. There's a story in John 4. Jesus is at the well. And there's this woman. She's, she's going there to get water for the day, right? Bring it back to her house. And Jesus sits down. And he starts talking with her. And he said, you know, if you knew who I was, you'd be asking me for water. And she's like, look, man, you got any buckets with you? You don't got a smart water or Fiji in your bag. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to get water from you. And he goes, no, 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 look at this. He said, you're going you're gonna to draw water from this well. And the minute you drink it, you'll need more. 
But whoever drinks the water that I have will never thirst again. Amen. And from within their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Ooh. Check out what Jesus is saying. He's saying, look, the water that you're thinking of is H2O, right? I'm not talking about the stuff that you turn the faucet on and stick your head under and drink. I'm talking about life. That's right. If you knew who I was, Jesus is saying, you would ask me for life and I would give it to you. Mm, right. And then when I give you my life, you're never the same. Right. He says, right. those who drink this water will never thirst again. You're never the same. If you knew who I was, you would be asking me for water. Jesus says in Revelation 21, to all who are in need, I will give, freely give, the water of life. We're into this place and we're feeling the burden of what it means to exist in this world. We're feeling the product of living in a broken world. That's just anxiety, anger, fear. All of these things are just dominating the lives of the people who are living on this earth except for those who have been united with Jesus, except for those who have been filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus says, look, if you're looking for life, don't look anywhere else other than to me. Amen. And Paul talks about this in, in 2 Corinthians 5. This is what Paul says, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 15, he says, Jesus died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves, Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised from them. And these last couple of weeks we've been talking about, what are you living your life for? Is it for yourself? Hmm. So many people on this earth, if they're not united with Jesus, the driving force of their life is selfishness. Yep. I'm living for my desires, for my purposes, and every relationship I have, every conversation I'm in, I'm trying to figure out how I can finesse it for me. That's right. But Paul's saying in 2 Corinthians 5, man, if you're living for Jesus, you're not living for yourself. You're actually living for God. And so he says that, right, in verse 15, jumping down to 17, he says, This means that anyone who belongs to Jesus has become a new person. The old life is gone, and a new life has begun. Amen. So often, man, we talk about this new life, we act like it's like this metaphorical, it's just this analogy. Like, Jesus, I say this all the time, Jesus stamped my ticket into heaven, so one day I'm going to cash it in when I die. That's how we view salvation sometimes. It's just like I'm trying to make it through this life, and one day I'll cash in, and I'll step into the kingdom of God. But what Paul's talking about is a new life that starts right here and right now. He's saying, man, no, no, Jesus didn't just come to get you into heaven one day. He came to bring you into a new life right here and right now. See, when you really drink the water that Jesus has, when you really take in the life that he's given to you, you begin to change. That's why Jesus yeah. said, when you drink this water from within your innermost being, will flow rivers of living water. Right. He's saying that when you drink of the life that I have for you, it permeates every fiber of your being so that wherever you go and whatever you do, I'm oozing out of you. Amen. I heard someone ask me one time, he's like, wouldn't it be weird if you squeezed an orange and apple juice came out? He's like, why is, it, why is it that when a Christian is squeezed, everything but Jesus comes out? <laughs> See, what Jesus is saying, when you really satisfy yourself in the Son of God, He takes residence in your heart, and He oozes out of you in everything that you do. See, Paul's saying that the old life is gone. God is saying, look, everything from your past, the burden, the bitterness, the anger, the destruction, the brokenness, all of those things has been washed away, and now God sees you as holy. Doesn't make sense. But it's because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. Amen. That's what happens when you receive the salvation of God. God sees you differently. And so then when I begin to rest in that fact that God, you don't see me for that broken, bitter, angry person anymore. You see me as a redeemed Son, someone who's been set free from the bondage of sin and death. You see me as one who's been actually made new. It changes the way that I, I, I think, that I operate, that I focus. Seven years ago, I met up. I, I, I'd gotten saved. Man, I, I, just the Holy Spirit took over in my heart. Ooh. And I began to experience transformation. Man, all the addiction, all the bondage, all the stuff that was on my life broke off. And I began to like look different, right? So one day, I get this, I get hit up from my friend. His name was Tommy. He hits me up. He goes, "Hey, do you want to go get lunch? I'm in town." He was going to school out in Oregon, so we we met up, and we go get uh, lunch. And he looks at me, 
And it was just like in the middle of the conversation, he said, what happened to you, man? <laughs> he said, what happened to you? You're totally different. And I said, man, there's one reason. Amen. Said, Jesus. Right. Jesus completely changed the way I think, the way I operate, the way I act. My decision. Everything that I touch is different now because I just think differently. Jesus rewired who I am. You know, he can't give me one of those looks. Like, ah. <laughs> but guess what? A few years later, I get a call. And on the other end That's of this right. call, this guy's sobbing. He had, a, he had an internship with, the, I think it's like the National Predators or something. Is it that hockey team? Yeah, I'm not in the hockey team. He gives me this call and he goes, everything's ruined, man. I just got a DUI and I'm going to lose my job and everything. And I can't shake the fact that two years ago when I saw you, you had a glow. And I want that glow. That's right. You see, when Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, the old has gone away, the new has come. It's a very literal new life that God gives to you, and transformation comes, and the world around you sees it and wants it, and they press in, and they say, where'd you get that from? And then they want Jesus, and they're hungry for Jesus. Some of us in here, though, we're, we're, we're still teetering on this edge, and we're coming in here, and we're feeling how the rest of the world feels. Like, we need new life. We want a fresh start. And we want a life of meaning and value and purpose. And we're looking at all these different places. It's relationships. It's, it's filling our life with drugs and alcohol, whatever it is. Mm. And we're trying to find meaning and value and purpose in these things. And God's saying, no, no, no it, it won't come from there ever. It doesn't matter how hard you try. It doesn't matter how, how hard you try to implement a New Year's resolution. It's never going to come from these slight alterations and tweaks you bring to your life. It's only going to come as you surrender to Jesus. See, change actually happens, not at the turn of a calendar year, but when I get to the end of myself and yeah. I say, Jesus, I don't want to be the God of my own life anymore. Amen. Mm -hmm. Everything that's controlled how I've lived and how I've operated and how I've maneuvered through life has been predicated and built around myself, but I don't want that anymore. I want you. And when I make that decision to surrender to Godship, the Lordship of Jesus in my life, that's when the rivers of living water that Jesus is talking about come. That's right. And all of a sudden this life, Jesus' life, fills my heart. And I realize the purpose that I was created for. Right. I was created to know God and to walk with Him. I want to ask you, you know, as we approach New Year's weekend. So many people, it's this big deal. We celebrate the turn of this new year as if so much has changed when right. the clock hits midnight. Oh, right, right. That changes everything. What if that, that change of the year was symbolic for us this weekend? What if it wasn't the turning of the year? What if it was the turning of your life? What if it was, man, walking into New Year's weekend, I'm feeling broken and bitter and alone or whatever you're feeling, but instead of just trying to brush it off and power through, I'm going to turn to Jesus and say, God, will you change my life? Yeah, right. God, will you come and give me real life? Will you come and give me real joy? Will you come and give me real peace? God, will you come and restore what's broken in my family, in right. my life, the relationships that I've left behind? Come and, come and make them right. Come and make them new. What if we actually gave God everything? Mm. See, New Year's great, whatever. But a new life is even better. Amen. And that can only come from one place. And so what I want to ask you this, this evening is, man, are you surrendered to Jesus? Mm. Have you received the new life that he has for you? So many people will say they believe in Jesus, but it's just intellectual belief. Yeah. James tells us that even the demons believe that God exists, right. and they shudder. Yeah. It's not enough just to believe that God exists. Have you surrendered to Jesus? Is he the Lord of your life? Have you asked his Holy Spirit to come and fill your heart? See, so many people believe in Jesus, but Jesus said, one day they will arrive at the footsteps of my kingdom and they'll say, Lord, we did all these things in your name. We healed the sick, we cast out demons, and he'll say, get away from me, I never knew you. See, what he's saying is you never had a relationship with me. You knew about me intellectually. You thought you were doing good things with your life, but you never actually surrendered to me and had a relationship with me. What I want to ask you tonight is, do you have a new relationship? See, we're going into this weekend. Everybody's making their list. How am I going to see my life change? What am I going to do to live a better life than I did the year before? But that can only start with Jesus, man. He's the ultimate reset. He's the ultimate new starting point. He's the ultimate redeemer of all things. 
And so I, I just want everyone really quick, just to close your eyes, bow your head. I want to pray for everybody in the room right now. Yeah, Jesus, we just thank you. You said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. God, apart from you, we have nothing. And God, some of us have come in here tonight bankrupt. God, we're realizing that our lives are empty of any good thing. God, we're feeling brokenless, broken, we're feeling hopeless, we're feeling alone. And Jesus, we can't look to the world to fill that void. We can only look to you. And so, God, I just pray, whoever's feeling that way in this room tonight, God, would you warm their heart? Would you touch them right now with your power? Would the truth of God convict them, God, and break through every hardened and callous layer of their heart? Some of us are in here, we're knowing, man, this is God tugging on me right now. I need to surrender to him. I need to give him my life. Don't wait. God, I just pray right now that you would bring us into a deeper understanding of who you are and what you're looking to do. God, would the peace of God come and flood every heart? If you're in this room right now and you're knowing that you're dead and you're broken and you're hopeless and you need life, I just encourage you to pray this with me. Jesus, come and fill my life with your goodness. Come and fill my heart with your spirit. God, I repent of walking and living my life for myself. I invite you, Lord, to come and fill me up. I surrender to your lordship. I receive your salvation and the fullness of your spirit. And I choose to follow you today. If you just prayed that prayer, Jesus says that the old has passed away and the new has come. You've literally received a new life. But that surrender that you just made, it needs to be a daily activity of surrendering to Jesus and continuing to follow him. So, Lord, I just thank you for what you're doing in this room. God, I thank you for the hearts that you're touching. I pray, God, that nobody would leave this room without first having looked to you and asking themselves, God, am I following you? Am I giving you my heart? Have I received your new life? In Jesus' name, God, amen. 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 prayed that prayer tonight, I want you to tell Pete, tell myself, tell Pastor Craig, Lynette, I want Mrs. Pastor, whatever, Cynthia, tell somebody about it, okay, Gordy, you got to tell somebody, okay, and uh, best decision you'll ever make in your life, so, and I love you guys, and uh, what a great week, and tell tell people about Chain Breakers, we'll be back next week again with Shatru, amazing, amazing guy, I can't wait you guys to hear him, so, Ready? Close us out. I sure hope 2023 is going to be better than 2022. <laughs> the class 2020 it just hasn't gotten any better. <laughs> well, do something about it. Yeah. Come on. No, I love it. And uh, yeah, let's, uh, we'll see you next week, next year. That's people right. are probably tired. Of it. I work next to people, and I say, "You betcha." <laughs> and I've been saying, "We'll see you next year." People, are like, I'm so tired of hearing them say, "We'll see you next year." <laughs> But we'll see you next year. Don't forget to change your oil. Also, do top spot, Social Club Misfits, man. Oh, God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I was going to tell you that last week, but you tapped out on us. I know. I know. So sometimes I can't always please Don. I have to please my wife, too. She was panicking because we were hosting Christmas and stuff. So, um... Yeah, dude, Social Club, they came out with a, a new album, too, recently. It's fire. But yeah, dude. so you listen, you got the Pandora rocking? Oh, uh, Apple Music. Oh, so Apple I got Music? downloaded and everything. Yeah? So. Yeah, no, they're, dude. And they got a good story, too, you know, because one of them's a pastor's kid, and the other one, you know, just kind of from, you know, it's kind of the same story as us, you know? Pastor's kids, they can sometimes have it the worst, you know? And one of the guys from Social Clubs, so it's Marty and Fern, and one of them was a pastor's kid, and, you know, there you go, G. Yay.